Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to be here with you today as we conclude our six-week series on the book of Ephesians. And of course, today I'll be looking at Ephesians chapter 6, and largely we'll be focusing on the idea of the armor of God. Now, last week I showed you this picture of Rebecca. Now, in this picture, Rebecca is dressed as me. And I showed it to you because as we went through chapter 5, we had this focus on the idea of imitating God. I talked about how we are called to specifically imitate Christ in terms of our words, in terms of our relationships, in terms of our actions, and in terms of our priorities. Now, I don't have another picture of Rebecca to show you this week, but I do have a picture of my dad, this picture. And I wanted to show you this picture to demonstrate the reason why today my dad looks like this instead of looking like this. And the reason that when you look at my father today, he doesn't look like this is because of a man named Jacques Plante. I suspect that many of you are already familiar with the name Jacques Plante. Jacques Plante was an NHL goalie in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s. He's a Hall of Famer, one of the greatest goalies of all time. But in a lot of ways, what he's known for the most is the fact that he was the first NHL goalie to wear a mask. On November 1st, 1959, in a game against the New York Rangers, Plant got hit in the face with a puck three minutes into the game. He was taken to the locker room, he was stitched up, but he told his coach, Toe Blake, that he would only return to the game if he was allowed to wear this mask that he'd been wearing in practices for a couple of years at that point. Coach Blake didn't want him to wear the mask. He thought it would prevent him from being able to see, but he didn't have any other goalies available, and so he was forced to relent. Well, Jacques Plante and the Canadians ended up winning that game, and the next 17 games as well. So Coach Blake relented, uh, and as we know, over the next number of years, all goalies in the NHL started wearing masks. And of course, all goalies wear masks in the NHL today. It's just common sense at this point. Now, what does this have to do with my father? Many of you will know that my dad played goalie for about 40 years uh, in the men's hockey league where a number of Bendale men played. And for a number of years, he played goalie without a mask. Now, eventually, a combination of common sense and my mother led to my dad wearing a mask. And I think it's worth crediting that decision for the fact that today my dad has all of his teeth. Now, what does any of this have to do with Ephesians chapter 6? In this chapter, Paul writes to the Ephesians about the armor of God. He talks to them about what they need to do, what they need to wear in order to be protected against the evils and dangers of this world, against the adversaries that are prepared and actively wanting to come out against us. And if we are going to defend ourselves, if we are going to defend the faith, then we need to be protected. In the same way that Jacques Plante knew that if he wanted his face to stop getting hit with pucks, he needed to be protected as well. And you might be sitting there at home right now thinking, that's 1959, Matthew. Couldn't you think of a more recent example of someone wearing a mask to stay protected? Yeah, sorry about that. Nothing else came to mind. Let's open up in prayer, and then we'll get into the text. God, we thank you so much for this day, and we continually thank you for the fact that we can meet together in this way, even in the midst of a pandemic. God, certainly we would all rather be at the church in person, but we are reminded that the church is not a building. The church is a people. It's the body of Christ of which we are all part. Uh, and so, God, I pray that you would help us to be grateful that we live at a time where we do have this online option for church. And certainly at the same time, we would pray for this city for this province, this country, and this world. We pray for um, therapies and vaccines and all sorts of treatments that would lead to the end of this pandemic uh, that we are currently in the midst of. But God, we recognize that even in the midst of it, you are sovereign, you are in control. And so today, as we look at Ephesians chapter 6, as we talk about standing firm in our faith, 
as we talk about putting on the armor of God, Lord, let this be real and practical for us. Let us not think about this as some ancient letter written from uh, one man to one church, but God, let us think about this as your word written to us. Uh, let it be real and practical for us today. Uh, and so I just pray that you would use this message to encourage us, to challenge us, uh, and let our actions in turn glorify you and build up your church. I pray all this in your son's most holy name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6 is a call for us as believers to stand firm. And as we go through this chapter today, I'd like to focus on three things. I'd like to focus on the call to stand for believers, the armor of God, and finally, the God of the armor. Several times in this chapter, Paul tells the church in Ephesus that they need to stand. In verse 11, he says, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. In verse 13, he says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. And in verse 14, he begins by saying, Stand firm then before launching into this description of the different pieces of the armor of God. If you're anything like me, all of the military language that we find in Ephesians chapter 6 might make you a little bit uncomfortable. Next month in December, when we celebrate Christmas, we're all going to be saying peace on earth, goodwill towards men, and celebrating the fact that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And I think it's sometimes more comfortable for us to talk about the peaceful side of the person of Jesus and uh, that element of our faith. And that is absolutely real, and that is absolutely who Jesus is. But at the same time, it's not entirely uncommon for us to find this sort of military language used in the Bible, in particular, when we're talking about God himself. Let's look at a few examples of this. Let's first take a look at some Old Testament examples of this sort of military language. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 17, it says, he put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. Obviously, this is a passage that Paul was familiar with when he wrote his letter to the Ephesians. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 5, it says, Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. And finally, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 29 says, He is your shield and helper, your glorious sword. Your enemies will cower before you, and you will tread on their heights. Even in the New Testament, in particular when we look at the writings of Paul, it's not uncommon for us to see him using this sort of military armor language. In Romans chapter 13, looking at verses 12 and 14, Paul writes, The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Clothe yourselves, he says, with the Lord Jesus Christ. And in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 8, Paul writes, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Now, what's the point in this armor? What's the point in all of this military language that Paul is using? Who is it that we're even trying to defend ourselves against? Now, Paul's pretty clear about this. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, he tells the Ephesians to put on the armor of God. Why? So that they can stand against the devil's schemes. He goes on in verse 12 to talk about authorities, to talk about spiritual forces, the rulers of this dark world. But the prime enemy that Paul is telling them to defend themselves against is Satan, the devil. This adversary that scripture describes as prowling around like a lion. And when we think about what it is that the devil does, how he tries to pull us away from God, how he tries to break through our defenses, we see very clearly in scripture that there are three things that he tries to do. Right off the top in Genesis, we see that he is the great tempter. He used his cunning and his position to convince Eve to eat the fruit. He tempted her, and, and in turn, Adam was tempted as well, 
so that they disobeyed God. This was the same tactic that he tried with Jesus in the desert. He tried to tempt Jesus when Jesus was at his weakest, having gone 40 days without eating or drinking. Now, of course, in that story, things went very, very differently because whereas Adam and Eve were not able to stand against his temptations, Jesus, of course, was. Now, beyond temptation, we see that Satan also plays this role of accuser. In fact, that's what the name Satan means. It means the accuser. And we see examples of this in the book of Job. Finally, beyond being a tempter and accuser, we know that Satan is a liar. And so when Paul talks about defending ourselves against Satan, it's really about defending ourselves against his temptations, against his accusations, against his lies, all of these things that he will attempt to try and pull us away from God. Paul says you need to stand against this, and if we're going to stand successfully, then we need to do so by putting on God's armor. Because if we're wearing this armor, which we're about to talk about, then we are not going to give in to temptation, we're not going to let Satan's accusations pull us away from God, and we're certainly not going to be convinced by any of Satan's wild lies because we are going to be firmly entrenched in God's truth. The armor of God that Paul describes in this passage is a six-piece ensemble made up of the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the only peace which functions also as a weapon, the sword of the Spirit. Let's talk first about the four pieces of this armor that are really meant for protecting us, in particular for protecting us against the attacks of Satan that we just talked about. We know that Satan is a tempter. And so that's why we need to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Because if we are firmly entrenched in righteousness, then we're not going to give in to temptation. Temptation will come, whether it's temptation that is coming directly from Satan or from our own intrinsically sinful nature. There are going to be times, there are going to be things that tempt us and we think it's not a big deal, it's just one little thing and that's a slippery slope to give into temptation. And there are all sorts of temptations. I don't think I need to describe any specific ones. You know your own life. You know the sorts of temptations which might be a danger for you. But if we are firmly entrenched in the righteousness of God, then we're not going to give in to te that temptation, which is why we wear that breastplate. We also know that Satan is an accuser. But you know what? If we are holding the shield of faith, and if we are wearing the helmet of salvation, then there is no accusation that Satan can bring against us that will pull us away from God, because our faith will be enough. We will be secure in the fact that we are saved. And if we know that we are saved, and if we know that by faith, then there is no accusation that Satan can make against us that will draw us away from God. There is absolutely nothing that Satan can say, no accusation that he can make that holds more weight than the work that Jesus did on the cross. And we can be secure in that by faith, knowing that in Jesus we are saved. Finally, like I said, Satan is a liar, and that's why we have to put on the belt of truth. When we are in truth, when we know truth, we are not going to be convinced by a lie. And by that extension, that's also why we hold on to this sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Because when we know God's Word, which is truth, we will never be convinced by a lie. Let's turn now to the one piece of the armor that Paul doesn't really give a catchy name to. Our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. It's not exactly as punchy as belt of truth or helmet of salvation but it's equally important that our feet be fitted with this readiness. Now, when I've talked about this piece of the armor in the past, either at camp or kids club or Sunday school, I've described it as being gospel shoes because that's exactly what Paul is talking about. He's talking about putting something on our feet that makes us ready 
to go take the gospel message to the nations. And so I call them gospel shoes. And look, as a long distance runner, I can tell you the difference between a good pair of shoes and a bad pair of shoes. The difference is, is blisters and walking around painfully for days afterwards. And so we, if we're going to take the gospel message to the nations, we need to be ready. Our feet need to be properly fitted. So we're not going to get halfway down the line and think, uh, I'm not wearing the right shoes, because that's not going to help anybody. This is at the core of the gospel message, that we as Christians are called to go. That's why we put on these gospel shoes. We're not called to stay in one place. And I know Paul tells us to stand, but we're also told to go. In the Great Commission, Jesus said to his disciples, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus said to his disciples, You will be my witnesses, first in Jerusalem, then in Judea and Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. As believers, we are called to go, and so we've got to get our feet ready to go. The gospel message is not meant to just be preached here in one place. We are meant to take it out to the nations, to take it out to all peoples from all walks of life. And so we've got to get our feet ready if we're going to go. Finally, we have the sword of the Spirit. I remember maybe 25 years ago having Bible time in my parents' basement, and my mom asked us this uh, sort of a riddle. She said, which is the only piece of the armor without which we wouldn't know about the other pieces? And the answer, of course, was the sword of the Spirit, because that is the Word of God. Without this book, without this sword, we wouldn't have Ephesians chapter 6, and so we wouldn't know about all the other pieces of the armor. So shout out to you there, Mom. God's Word, the sword of the Spirit, is our greatest weapon. It will cut through all of the enemy's lies. It will cut through all of his accusations. It will cut down any temptation that he might raise for us. There is no other weapon that we can take into this fight which will have the sort of impact that God's Word has. So we've talked about the armor of God. Now let's talk about the God of the armor. As I already read for you earlier, in Romans 13 verse 14, Paul says, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he talks about putting on the armor of God, this is very much what Paul means. He is telling us to clothe ourselves with Jesus. In fact, this very much connects to what we looked at last week in Ephesians chapter 5. This idea that we are to imitate Christ, that we are to be like him. Because every piece of the armor of God corresponds to qualities that we see when we look at Jesus himself. We put on the belt of truth because he is truth. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We put on the breastplate of righteousness because he is righteous. In Psalm 11, verse 7, it says, For the Lord is righteous. The reason why we get our feet fitted with these gospel shoes to take the gospel out to the nations, this gospel of peace, is because he is a God of peace. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, Paul writes, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you. The reason that we hold this shield of faith is because we can put our faith in him. Why? Because he is faithful. Paul says that verbatim. In 1 Corinthians 1 9, he tells us God is faithful. And finally, we put on this helmet of salvation. Why? Because salvation belongs to our God, as it says in Revelation chapter 7 verse 10. With this in mind, we see that putting on the armor of God is not just some abstract metaphor that Paul is using. It's not some cool analogy where he talks about different pieces of armor because that helps us to think about living life as a soldier. No, in a very real, very practical way, this is about imitating Christ. This is about putting on the attributes of Christ. This is about becoming more and more like him.
so that when we go out into the world, when we go out to share the gospel, when we go into battle, we are going out as his representatives, looking like and acting like him. To teach us a little bit more about the God of the armor, I want to look at the ending portion of Ephesians chapter 5 and the starting portion of chapter 6, which wasn't actually in our reading today. Uh, I talked about this a little bit last week, although I shoveled some of it off to this week as well. The way that Ephesians is organized um, is always a little bit strange to me, and this is no fault of Paul's. Paul's not the one who put in the chapter and verse divisions, but at the end of chapter 5 and at the start of chapter 6, Paul talks about relationships between uh, different groups of people. He talks about the relationship between husbands and wives at the end of chapter 5, and then he talks about the relationships between parents and children, and then slave owners and slaves. That's in chapter 6. And I've always thought that it would have been maybe a little bit clearer to have uh, those passages grouped together, and um, which is why I struggled trying to figure out whether to put them all in last week or put them all in this week. And I didn't want to leave them out altogether. But as we keep talking about the God of the armor, I think that looking at what Paul says about how we ought to treat others in our relationships teaches us about the nature of God himself. When Paul talks about husbands and wives, he tells them that they need to love and submit to each other. Our God is a God of love, and our God is a God of peace and unity. And this is what God wanted to see and, and continues to want to see in Christian marriages. He wants to see this sort of love and submission and unity. And as we look at all of this military description in chapter 6, we can forget maybe for a moment that we are not called to be militant in the way that we treat each other in our relationships. We're called to be loving and submissive, and we are called to unity in marriages. When Paul talks about the relationships between parents and children, he says, children, be obedient to your parents. But parents also, don't exasperate your kids. Again, he is looking for this sort of love and unity in the parental child relationship. Now, beyond that, Paul also talks about slave owners and slaves. And I feel like I have to say this. Now, it might be clear, but I think it's worth saying. This is not Paul advocating slavery. The reality is, he was writing to people who owned slaves or may have been slaves. Slavery was a reality in that part of the world at that point in history. And right or wrong, and certainly I would say wrong when we're talking about slavery, Paul's purpose at this time in this letter was not to uh, break the chains of earthly slavery. He wanted to break the chains of sin by telling people about Jesus Christ. And knowing that the reality at this time was that there were people who owned slaves and there were people who were in slavery, Paul wanted to address how these people ought to relate to each other. And so he told slaves that, that they needed to be obedient. He said that they needed to serve them as though they were serving God. And to slave owners, Paul said, treat them well. This tells us a lot about God, that God looks at the relationships that we have in our lives and he wants us to strive for peace and love and unity and submission. He doesn't want to see us breaking each other down, but he wants to see us building each other up and ultimately giving glory to God by having these really positive godly relationships. I said a few minutes ago that the sword of the spirit is the only piece of the armor that also functions as a weapon. But Paul makes it very clear in this passage that that's not the only weapon that we have. Starting at verse 18, Paul says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. 
When we find ourselves in circumstances and we feel unprotected, we need to pray. When we find ourselves in circumstances and things are going really well, we need to pray then as well. I mean, this is our weapon, this is our tool, this is our lifeline. Prayer is what keeps us connected to God. And so if we are to go out into this world, if we are going to try and be ambassadors for the gospel, if we're going to try and stand against the devil and all of his temptations and accusations and lies, if we are doing all of that and we are not praying, that is pretty silly. To go into battle and to never talk with your commander doesn't make any sense. We need to be constantly in prayer and this constant communication with God. Like I said last week when I read Mark chapter 1, if Jesus himself got up early in the morning to go find a private place to pray, if he needed to do that, how much more do the rest of us need to make sure that we are spending time with God in prayer? So that's the deal. We are called to stand. We are called to go out into battle as members of God's army, not being militant for the sake of being militant, but putting on the armor of God for our protection and ultimately so that we can become more and more like him. As we put on this armor, we are putting on the attributes of Christ, being made more and more like him every day. And you know, the wonderful thing about this message of this battle that we are going into is that the battle has already been won. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 to 58, Paul writes this, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I don't know what challenges you're going to face this week. I don't know what challenges I'm going to face this week. But I do know this. If we go out into the world, if we are dressed in his armor, if we've got the sword of the Spirit in one hand, the shield of faith in the other, and if we are praying constantly, then you know what? We're going to be all right. We will be able to stand. And the reality is, the victory has already been won. We have a victory in Jesus Christ that can never be taken away. The God of the armor, he's good. And he's on our side. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this scripture. We thank you that uh, we can be secure in our knowledge of the fact that we have victory in you. God, I pray that you would help us to daily put on the armor of God, becoming more and more like you each and every day. Let us not forget to open up your word. Let us not forget to come to you in prayer. But God, let us be constantly connected to you through the lifeline that is prayer. God, you are so good to us. You have continued to be so good to us, even in the midst of strange and difficult times. And God, I thank you for all that we have in Jesus. I pray all this in your son's most holy name. Amen. All right, go in peace. Have a great week.